guy's walking down the street when he falls into a hole. The walls are steep and he can't get out. He calls up to a doctor who's passing by and says, hey doctor, I'm down in this hole, can you help me? The doctor writes out a prescription, throws it in the hole, and moves along. Then a priest walks by. Father, I'm down in this hole, can you help me? The priest writes a prayer, throws it in the hole, walks on. Then a friend comes by. Hey Joe, it's me. I'm down in this hole, can you help me? A friend jumps in the hole and our guy says, are you stupid? Now we're both stuck in this hole. And our friend says, yeah, but I've been here before and I know the way out. This is a speech given by Leo McGarry in season two of The West Wing, my favorite TV show. It is a variation of the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is familiar in the Christian tradition and further exemplified by this piece of art by my friend Micah Player. The thing with these situations is that we can see when somebody is hurt or stuck when they are in need of assistance. But there are a lot of people whose need for assistance isn't quite as clear. There are a lot of people out there who have hitches and hurdles and holes and hardships that we can't see clearly. There's a lot of people who look like this. I've broken both my hands and had one reconstructed. I've completely torn two ligaments in my ankle. I have had pneumonia, I have had an ovarian cyst rupture, I have had an emergency DNC. With each of these, there is some sort of an indicator that something is wrong, whether that is pain or a fever, something that prompts us to go to the doctor, we are able to get a diagnosis, and then start on a path towards healing. But mental illness doesn't quite work the same way. When I first suspected that something might not be quite working the way it's supposed to in my brain, there were a series of events leading up to a conversation in 2015 with my husband, during which he told me that I was not the same person that I had been before. I was more tired, I was more quick to judge, I was more angry. I chalked it up to stress in my job at the time, but there was something about his question that lingered, and like a labyrinth, I knew that I wanted to figure out where it ended up. Things with mental illness often start small, tiny, insignificant. We have a thought that we're a little bit more focused on than normal. We're a little bit more worried than normal. We're a little bit more prone to anger than normal. And it doesn't seem like a big thing. It doesn't seem significant. But then these little tiny threads start wrapping around each other. And seemingly, all of a sudden, the mind is bound. There were several different incidences that made me believe what was going on might have been problematic. And I still wasn't certain that it wasn't something I could just think myself out of. I was driving across town to a meeting and told myself that all I needed to do was come up with two or three times that I had been happy and prove that I was still the same person. I sat in that meeting and I scrolled back month by month by month. And the last time that I had been happy, all the way, without any weight, had been 2010. That was five years before. I had laughed. I would had some glad times. But it was never all the way free of weight. Nobody noticed. I didn't notice. After the conversation and the realization that there might be something wrong, when I was alone at my house, I started Googling symptoms of depression. You know when you take those online quizzes to figure out which Harry Potter character or which Disney princess you are, and then you get a result that you don't like? So you take more. <laughs> That's what I did with depression quizzes. One after another, they kept showing up. And I even tried to adjust what I was feeling and what I was experiencing so that I could get even one that came back showing that I was OK. But I wasn't. Um, things got bad in 2016. Bad enough that I cried in a restaurant. Bad enough that my husband asked me if I was considering self-harm, if I was considering suicide. After that, I called and hung up the phone five times before I was able to finally schedule an appointment to talk to my doctor about depression. And then I wept because I hadn't been strong enough to think myself out of it. Even when I went to the doctor's office, I a little bit thought that he was going to tell me that I just needed a little bit more rest and exercise. I think it's fairly common for people to experience the stages of grief when they are diagnosed with a mental illness, but even the expanded seven stages didn't really embody everything that I was feeling. There was a profound amount of shame. I was somebody who was working at a high school. 
I was raising three kids reasonably well. I had a good marriage. I had family support nearby. I got out of my bed every morning. I got in the shower every day. This was not how it was supposed to happen. I could not understand why this was happening. When I was sitting in my doctor's office, filling out the survey that they have you fill out for um, various mental illnesses, I didn't mark something if I couldn't 100% all the way with conviction think of a couple times that I had experienced that. Um, I, I really thought that my doctor was going to tell me to get some more rest and exercise. These are the symptoms for depression. Depressed mood, diminished interest or pleasure in activities, insomnia or hypersomnia, significant weight loss or weight gain, fatigue or loss of energy, feeling of worthlessness, recurrent thoughts of death. But did you notice, in order to be diagnosed with depression, you have to have been having the symptoms for two weeks. Things had been really bad for five months. I had been slipping for five years. And even then, after three years of antidepressants and six months of therapy, I finally came to realize that I was also coping with anxiety. For those of you who are bad at math, that's a lot longer than two, two weeks. It's way too long. I was fortunate enough to be given, to find a, a medication that worked well for me the first time. And what I mean by this is that after taking it for about 10 to 14 days, I was able to feel the weight that had been permeating my life lift a little bit, enough that I noticed. But there's a couple things about mental illness medication that I want to clarify. One, there's a lot of people when they go on this kind of medication that about two weeks after starting it will go into another sort of depression. This isn't a side effect of the medication, but rather an awareness of how long people had been working through things that were very hard when there was something they could have done to help a little bit. Two, I still have bad days. There's a lot of people when they talk about mental illness that they like to compare it to diabetes. And that's really great in helping the naysayers who tell me that I just need to read a few more positive thoughts or read some more self-help books. I am not gonna think myself out of depression any more than somebody with diabetes is gonna think themselves out of diabetes. There are real chemicals at play. Mental illness medication works a lot like cold medication in that it masks the symptoms and it creates an opportunity for a person to return to a more authentic version of themselves that does not cure. True healing requires a lot more than that. Still, we have people who say that mental illness is on the rise, that it's because kids these days have gone soft. There's a lot of people who like to throw out nicknames, Snowflake seems to be a favorite, as a means to elevate themselves or diminish others. While this is clearly problematic on about 17 million levels, there's a couple things I'd like to clarify. Shakespeare's King Lear, Hamlet, and Macbeth all explore what happens to somebody when their mind isn't working the way that it's supposed to. The Yellow Wallpaper was published in 1892 and shows what happens to a woman when she has a mental illness that neither she nor her loved ones understand. Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway shows a World War I vet who has what we would now call PTSD. And the bell jar by Sylvia Plath looks at depression and mental health institutions in the 1950s. Even cigarette, commercial, or cigarette ads used to target people as a means to help them calm their nerves. That's anxiety. When we talk about people who sat in their chairs, either on the front porches or wherever, and they were warriors, that's depression. We have been talking about mental illness for a long time, but not using the same words. The only thing that has changed is that we are now continually on the quest to see if we can help people instead of dismissing them, or worse, locking them up. Brene Brown's work has been fundamental in helping me in my healing process, particularly when she says, Shame needs three things to grow exponentially in our lives. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. Shame cannot survive being spoken. It cannot survive empathy. I decided to put this to the test. This May, on the first day of Mental Health Awareness Month, I posted the following. This is the first time most of my friends found out that I had mental illnesses. This is the first time anybody outside of my husband, kids, and a couple very, very close friends learned that I was going to therapy. And I have to admit to cringing when I hit post. But then something happened. 
I'm no Kardashian. And my little corner of the socials usually warrants a couple dozen reactions more when it's something about the kids. But people started reacting and liking and reaching out, and my shame crawled back into a corner. Throughout the month of May, I posted a new insight into mental illness every single day, and something started happening. People started reaching out, saying they understood that they got it, asking me for recommendations of how to start a conversation with a doctor, asking if I had any ideas of who they could talk to for a therapist. I had friends who reached out who said that this was exactly the kind of thing that they were living with, and friends who reached out who said that maybe, just maybe, the loss of drive and anxiety and anger and frustration and depression and sadness and sorrow that they had been carrying for a long time was no longer something they had to carry. People started talking, and they are still talking. Months later, I have friends who come up and will comment about these posts that I did throughout the month of May. Why do you think that is? The answer is because mental illness is everywhere. It's everywhere. This is the number of people who have mental illnesses in the United States right now. This does not include teens and children. TV shows and movies will often exemplify somebody as having a mental illness a certain way, or will depict the way that somebody with a mental illness is treated. And for a lot of these people, that is reason enough for them to not pursue a conversation or to engage in dialogue. Here's what we do know. Most of the people who have a mental illness are not seeking treatment. And most of the people who have mental illnesses show up in their adulthood did not have any symptoms of it as a child growing up. One in five of us experienced a mental illness last year. Look around the room. Think about your colleagues. Think about your family. One in five. And things are actually a little bit worse for us who live in certain elevations. Researchers at the University of Utah have found that people within a certain range of elevations are more prone to depression and suicide, and that those people also tend to respond less well to antidepressants. The American Foundation of Suicide Prevention has shown that on average, one person dies by suicide in the state of Utah every 13 hours. That is one person every 13 hours. I have wanted to die. These are the risk factors and warning signs that I have experienced, and more than once. It's kind of hard to explain, because it feels like a dreamlike state. Last year, I was at a conference across the country and was triggered several times by several different things in a close amount of time. From my hotel window, I could see a tall, gorgeous white building, and all I wanted to do was figure out how to get to the top and take a step off. I wanted to experience the freedom of free fall, the weightlessness, the release. I did not leave my hotel room for several hours. I have no idea how to get to the top of that building. But in that moment, continuing to fight this mental illness felt daunting, overwhelming, unsurvivable. I can't imagine how my husband must have felt when I called him, when I asked him to please just talk to me while I cried on the other end of the line. But his concern, his love, his fear and the hopefulness in his voice grounded me. It grounds me. We have a candidly honest relationship and that has saved me from going down an unkind, unsafe path many times. There's a lot of people who are hesitant to reach out when somebody has a mental illness because we are afraid that we are not gonna say the right thing, that we won't know what to do. While having a mental illness often feels like we are lost at sea, we don't expect the people in our lives to be the lighthouses. We know that the doctors and the, the therapists are the lighthouses. Still, the two most terrifying points of my mental health journey have been going to the doctor and going to the therapist. Before GPS and digital technologies, people at sea relied on both the brilliance of the lighthouse and a different set of lights, called range lights, leading lights, or lower lights. They would navigate their craft so that these two lights aligned with each other, and then they would have confidence that they were on the right path. Before I went to the doctor, I had a conversation with my dad, my husband, and a close family friend who each suggested there might be something that could help my mind get back on track. 
when I realized that I needed to talk to somebody who knew how to help me, when I needed another assistance in trying to heal, I went and talked to a, a work colleague who works in the same industry and recommended a couple people. These people served as my leading lights and helped me understand that the direction that I was going could be safe. In 1871, Philip Lee Bliss wrote a hymn that was later covered by John and Cash called Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. The refrain says, let the lower lights be burning, cast a gleam across the way, some poor struggling fainting seaman, you may rescue, you may save. If you are a person who is struggling with mental illness, I plead with you to find the courage that it takes to reach out, to call out to someone, no matter how deep your hole and no matter how steep your walls. And if you are someone who loves someone with mental illness, I am asking you to talk to them as you can and to listen as you are able, because hope driving away fear is the first step of every rescue. Thank you for listening.